Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Amanda, and I'm coming to you live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And I'm so excited that you decided to join us today. Now, as we explore the world of fish and have some fishy fun, we invite you to participate with us by texting the number that you see on your screen right now. So if you have any questions as we're talking about fish, uh, go ahead and let us know at 562 286 1838 and we will be happy to uh, answer that question as we're talking live. Now of course if you're watching this at a later time and we're no longer doing the live broadcast you can text in or I'm sorry you can email in any questions that you have at live at lbaop.org. So LB for Long Beach and then AOP for Aquarium of the Pacific and we'll have one of our staff members get back to you um, at a later time. So no matter how you're watching or when you're watching, uh, we invite you to ask your questions uh, because we want to help you wonder, explore, discover, and learn today. And we're going to be using a few tools to help us do that here in the studio. So I have my friend Stacy who will be responding to your text questions and letting me know what they are. I also have my friend Alicia who's controlling uh, the cool stuff that's going to appear uh, behind me on the camera. And we are going to take advantage of some webcams that we have in our exhibit to look at some of the fish that we have here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. So since you can't come visit us, we are bringing the aquarium to you. And right behind me, this happens to be a picture of our largest exhibit here at the aquarium. It's 350,000 gallons of salt water, and we have a lot of different types of fish in it. Now, as we talk about fish, let's kind of go over what the main fish characteristics are. And if you would like to uh, let me know, you can talk to the people in your room. You don't have to text us because if you do text, make sure that you have your parents' permission uh, because text uh, messaging rates may apply. So please keep that in mind. But if you don't want to text, you can just shout to someone else who's in your room or talk to a, a pet um, and let them know what are the things that you observe about fish. What is it that is so special that makes a fish a fish? If you'd like to text us in, you can. But what are the special characteristics of fish? How are they different from a dog or a cat or a snake or, I don't know, even a frog? What kinds of things are special about them? Now, there's lots of different kinds here. It's a great sampling here of a lot of different species. Now, here, this one, a lot of people notice that one with the big long tail. That is a zebra shark. Very interesting type of fish. Now, the question is, are sharks fish? Sometimes people aren't really sure. They think, well, you talk about fish and you talk about sharks as being different types of animals. But my question for you is, are sharks fish? Now, we do have some focuses or some programs that focus just on sharks, but let's also take a little, we'll include them today as we're talking on our fish program. But still waiting to hear, what are those things that are special? Well, as you look at their bodies, what things stand out to you? How are they different from birds? Well, they still have to get around through their environment. So you think about the special adaptations that an animal has. And adaptations are things that help that animal to survive in that habitat. So in an underwater habitat, compared to the air where birds live, birds will use their feathers and their wings to help them to fly. Well, what do the fish have on their bodies here that help them to get through their watery world? Well, I have another example, a closer view. Oh, there's a little turtle coming through. <laughs> Uh, we have, or I have this little clownfish here. Now, obviously, they have these things all over their bodies to help them swim. And what are they? They're fins. Now, all fish have fins, do they? Do you have fins on all of the fish that are in here? Well, initially, yeah, fish have fins. In general, fish have fins. Are there some exceptions? Well, there's actually a, an eel that doesn't really have any fins. Ends. If you look at this guy right here, now he's a little bit different. He does have what kind of looks like this big long ridge along his back here, but he doesn't have any fins sticking out on the side. Like my clown friend has these two fins on the side. Now, do any of you know what those two fins on the side of a fish are called? You might not. It's not a very common name uh, that many people use too often, but these are called pectoral fins. Pectoral fins are the ones on the side. Now, my fish here has two fins on its back, and these have a special name too. And that is a type of fin um, that, you know, you might see something that looks like a ridge here, but again, they, the eels here don't have the pectoral fins. 
that, ooh, we're going to show you an eel swimming. So you can see how they swim. Um, I'll sneak out of the way until we get that up. But take a good look at that eel because an eel is a fish, but he just doesn't have those same fins on the side of his body. So look at that eel that's swimming right here. This is a California moray eel. And again, no fins on the side. And this is kind of a special characteristic of eels. Now, he does have that long ridge. Do you see that? That long, like, dorsal fin along his back. And you can see him kind of like a ribbon shape. In fact, that's what they call the shape of an eel. Fish have lots of different shapes. Look at how different it looks from the shape of this giant sea bass here in our blue cavern exhibit. So this is another webcam into one of our other exhibits here. Now this one is actually looking very different than the last one you saw. Not quite as bright and colorful, but that's because this one is modeled after a kelp forest. Uh, and actually modeled after a real dive site off of Catalina Island off our coast here in Southern California. So we modeled this one after a kelp forest habitat um, called Blue Cavern off Catalina Island. And there's some really interesting fish in here. This one's called a California sheephead, kind of hiding off in the back. And then the giant sea bass really love to get in the spotlight here and come up to the, our, our webcam. So you might see some close-ups of them um, if we continue to look at this camera. Uh, but now let's again talk about these fins. So these two fins on the back are what are called dorsal fins. So if you think about the back side of your, your own back, if you pat yourself on the back right now, that is your dorsal side. Dorsal means back. So any fish that has fins on its back has a dorsal fin. Oh, look at our eel swimming by. That ribbon shape and that ribbon shape helps him without those fins on the side, without having his pectoral fins, he can squeeze really easily in between areas like rocks and into small little spaces where he can hide that other larger fish would not be able to fit into. So the body shape of a fish helps it to survive and is an adaptation. Now again, if you look at the shape of this big guy, of this giant sea bass, he's what we call fusiform. Fusiform means football shape, kind of shaped like a football. In fact, this one's kind of shaped like a football too. It's kind of wide in the middle and then kind of tapers down at the ends. So again, we have a ribbon shaped fish and then we have the fusiform shaped fish right here. Now, what about this one? He kind of looks kind of kind of football shaped, a little fusiform too. That's a very common shape in the ocean to help them get through the water more easily. It's what we call hydrodynamic, so that they can cut through the water without a lot of resistance. It makes them much faster swimmers too. Okay, well, what about the, the ways that they use those fins? So I'd like you to look at the body shape. We've looked at two different body shapes and we've looked at where the fins are, but maybe we can find how they're using their fins. Now, what is helping this fish swim through the water? Are they using those pectoral fins to move them really, really fast forward? Or are they using the fin on their back? In fact, oh, here comes our giant sea bass. Uh, maybe if he turns around, maybe we'll, oh, there's actually the fin of one right back there. Did you see their fins? Oh, look at the fins on this one. Here's the dorsal fin. It does actually look like he's kind of moving it a little bit, but what fin is he using the most to move through the water? Do you notice that? He's using his, oh, <laughs> everyone's swimming by right now. And in fact, the whole body of our moray eel as he's swimming is pushing him through the water. But what do you think we call this fin? This one right here is a caudal fin. And so the tail fin has another scientific name called the caudal fin. And that's what many fish use to push themselves through the water. Now this is another type of anemone fish that's hanging out in the sea anemone, just like our clownfish friend here. And you might notice their fins kind of on the side. These are their pectoral fins, and you can see him kind of waving them around. But again, he's, you can see his dorsal fin, and you can see his, you can't see his tail fin very well, but sometimes in the very back you can see his uh, caudal fin that's helping him move. Here's a nice picture. We can see all the fins. But do you notice some other fins that we didn't talk about yet? You can see the dorsal fin. In fact, how many dorsal fins do you see on this fish? You notice two? Yeah, they have a dorsal fin up here, and then they also have this other dorsal fin. And if you look really carefully, you'll see it's orange, black, and then there's also this like thin kind of transparent or see-through area of the dorsal fin. Isn't that interesting? Now, these two fins, though, we didn't talk about. 
the ones on the side, remember, those are the pectoral fins, and the tail fin down here is called the caudal fin. But what about these two right here? Well, those are called pelvic fins, and fish use pelvic fins in all sorts of interesting ways. In, fun, in fact, one of my favorite types of fish, because I think they are so cute, has these very special pectoral fins, and they actually kind of make like a little circle and allow them to stick onto things. And so the pelvic fins can be used to help them to stick. So animals use their fins in different ways. They're not always used just to swim through the water. Now, what's really neat to watch when you see a clownfish is that they will use all these fins. You'll see those dorsal fins kind of moving like this. They mostly power with their tail fins, their caudal fin, but they do also use those pectoral fins to help them move. This one, though, is a very special one. And don't you agree with me? Don't you think he's really cute? This is called a spiny lump sucker. So lump suckers, look at their fins right here. Do you see them? They're like little suction that help them to stick onto these rocks. These little um, lump suckers, good name for it because they're kind of like they're sucking on, sticking on. Here's a better picture how you can see how it's almost like a suction cup on a rock. So these are the lump suckers and instead of having the outside body that we see of our clownfish friend, uh, because that's another thing that's special about fish, is what their bodies are covered with. You know what it is? Yeah, you can shout it out. They're covered in scales. So they have scales, but the spiny lump sucker doesn't have regular scales. Instead, it has these little pokey plates all over their bodies. Uh, so if they have a particular name, I don't remember exactly what they're called, but they're very, very cute. Uh, oh, here's also another strange looking animal. Do you know what kind of animal this is? Well, it's another type of fish, but he's got this really huge mouth. He looks very, very grumpy. And this mouth is really good for helping him really quickly suck in food that might come in front of him and maybe even from above him because look at how different his fins are. So his pelvic fins and his pectoral fins on the side kind of help him to sit on the bottom, almost like little stands or like little feet that help them sit on the bottom and kind of move around a little bit. He does still have a dorsal fin and he has, he has a caudal fin right back there, uh, but they have an interesting way of attracting fish to come on over to them. They have a little lure like angler fish that can stick out that looks like a little piece of little tiny fish that might attract other fish over to it. It might look like a little piece of plankton to something that eats smaller things. And as it comes on over, it uses this big giant mouth to grab that fish and suck it on in. But look at how well it camouflages with this sort of rocky and bumpy background around it. Well, obviously it's orange color kind of stands out to us, but look at how bumpy it is and all these marks. It looks very different from that smooth, scaly uh, skin of, the, um, of our clownfish friend here. So still bright and colorful, but also very hard to see. But can you find his eye? It's right there. And here's where the other eye is. You just can't see the little eyeball at it like you can right here. Uh, but very interesting fish. Now there's another really cool fish that has this huge mouth that kind of has a grumpy face to it too. It's even bigger than the mouth of this hogfish here. And it has a very funny name. It's called a sarcastic fringe head. Now that's a strange fish. Now the sarcastic fringe head has, well, think about fringe head. What is fringe and what would that look like? We're gonna pull it up our computer and we're gonna show you what it looks like. You get to see all of our computer right now. And we are going to um, take a look. Think about fringe, what would that look like? Fringe on your head. So maybe they have something up on their head, but sarcastic, that's a strange word. Well, this fish, almost like he's just always making jokes, always wants to laugh. He's got this huge mouth. Almost looks like, well, he kind of looks like he could be grumpy, I suppose. But it also looks, you should see what it looks like when he opens it because it's enormous. So when someone's using sarcasm, right, sometimes they, they make things a little bit bigger than they really are, maybe not telling the truth. Well, maybe that's what this guy does because this is way bigger. His mouth is way bigger than you think it's going to be. 
And this right here, you can even see a little bit of his teeth right there. This long mouth, it also has sort of a, a pouty face when it's kind of closed or if you were to see it from the side, but it has this extra skin right here on the sides. So when it opens its mouth, it flares out to the side. You can see this bright sort of a lime green color on the inside. And this is what the sarcastic fringe head fish will do to kind of stake their own territory and make sure that people know and that other fish know that this is my area and this is my space where I'm going to protect the eggs from another female. So what happens is they will make their way, see how this one's kind of in a shell? They'll find empty shells from empty snail shells in the ocean and they'll make their way inside of it, kind of like how a hermit crab does. The sarcastic fringe head has to find a bigger shell because it's a little bit bigger fish and it will back inside of it and claim his area. And then he'll guard eggs, Very, he's a very protective father and he will make sure that the eggs are nice and safe until they're ready to hatch. But I think it's really interesting to see how big their mouths are because when another sarcastic fringe head comes over too close or if he's trying to compete for another female, they'll open their mouths really big, they flare out to their sides and then they get face to face and they try to show off who's got the bigger mouth. And the one with the bigger mouth, he actually gets to stick around and uh, guard those eggs. So very interesting fish. Now Lily and Walker want to know why do his fins look like hands? Oh, so talking about the animal right here, the frogfish, he does. It looks like he almost has like little one, two, three, four, five. It almost looks like he's got little nubby fingers right on top, right? Or little feet. And they look like that to help them plant themselves better on the ground because they kind of spend their day sitting on the bottom and they just wait for food to come by. So they don't go out shopping a whole lot. They just sit there and they wait for something to come by them and then they grab it with that big mouth of theirs. And so that's kind of why they look like that because they use them in different ways. Now again, going back to like this fish here, this is the Queensland grouper. Notice he's got pectoral fins and they're kind of low um, on his body. He's also got this fin back here. Now this one is called the anal fin. So you'll notice that on other fish too. They don't usually use that very much for swimming to move through the water. See, there's the anal fish or the anal fin on that fish right there. And this one, oh, sometimes it's harder to see, but they also use those for helping them actually get rid of the waste out of their body. Uh, but that's another interesting fin to look for. Now, if you look at the fins of other fish, like, oh, like some of these fish back here in the corner, uh, you can see that they have kind of skinnier pectoral fins. Oh, this one has a very sharp, oh, I can't point to them very well. That one right there was called a trevally. It has a very pointed dorsal fin. Oh, but look at how the stingray is using its fins. It uses its pectoral fins to move through the water, almost like it's flying through the ocean. So here's a nice picture of a bat ray from our ray pool where you can touch stingrays here. And it's got one of its pectoral fins way up and the other one down here. And that's what they use for moving through the water because do they have a caudal fin like the other fish we were talking about? No, they have a long tail, but they don't have a caudal fin that they move to push themselves through the water. So that's very different. Now, getting back to sharks, we said, well, we were wondering, are sharks fish? Well, they do have the fins like the fish have, right? Now also think about how do these animals survive underwater? How do they breathe? What do they have? They have gills. Now, sharks have gills, fish have gills. So they breathe the same thing, the same thing that they're using, gills. Um, so yes, actually sharks are a type of fish and stingrays are a type of fish. Here's a great picture of a great white shark and you can see the gill slits on the side. But do you notice how it looks different from the fish we were looking at? The fish we were looking at didn't have these slits on the sides of their heads. They have a covering called an operculum that goes over their gills. So this little area, do you see that little line right there? That is a little covering that they put over their gills. Because just like you and I, when we breathe, when we breathe in the air, it's going into our lungs, which is inside of our body. And then our body takes the air, takes the oxygen from the air, and then sends it through our body, through our blood. Now, that's what fish do as well, except not with air. 
they use the water to get oxygen. So they're getting oxygen from the water. So as it comes through, it might come through their mouth right here, and then it goes inside their body. So inside them, they have their gills, and the gills are pulling the oxygen from the water to help them breathe and then pumping it through their body. This is what the gills look like. They're right underneath that little flap. Now that flap is called an operculum. It's like a little door over it. And then if you were to take one out and look at just one gill filament, they have this arch right here. And then they have these things that come forward called gill rakers to make sure that their food is not getting stuck in their gills. That would not be a good thing. And just like we don't want our food going into our lungs, we would choke. But they would not be able to breathe very well if they had food stuck in their gills. But these gill filaments are what's actually taking the oxygen from the water to help the fish to breathe. So interesting, both fish and sharks have gills but bony fish, and I say bony because they have bones in their, inside their body. Their skeleton's made out of bones, whereas sharks and rays have skeletons made out of cartilage. Now, cartilage is actually something you and I have as well. Do you know where it is? Point to your nose. Do you feel your ears? Yeah, so this is cartilage. Your ears and your nose, they're much more flexible than, say, your elbow. If you touch your elbow, it's really hard. It's made out of bone. So your nose and your ears are made out of cartilage, much more flexible. And that's what the skeleton of sharks, like this zebra shark, are made out of. So this right here, I know it doesn't look very much like a zebra, but when this shark was born and it hatched out of an egg, and yes, I did say egg, some sharks hatch out of eggs, it had black and white stripes that resemble the stripes of a zebra. But then as they get bigger, those black and white stripes fade away. They start to turn into spots. But if you look carefully, do you see those little areas right there? Those are where the stripes used to be. So there's kind of like this white and then this black, those black dots all around it kind of outlining that uh, stripe. So those black dots used to be a black stripe as well, black lines as well. But then as they mature, uh, they just turn into spots and so they look a little bit different. So this is kind of a young one, so you can still see a little bit of the remnants of the stripe. But again, it's an example of a shark and this is what it looks like when it's inside of its shark egg. So the shark egg has these filaments that are all sticky that help the shark egg attach to something like a rock or some kelp so it doesn't just float all over the ocean. So that as the shark is growing inside this little pouch here and it has a little yolk sac that it's using to help nourish it and feed it, kind of like a sack lunch. So it's like going on a field trip and you have to bring a lunch with you. Um, that's kind of how the mama shark takes care of the baby. That's about as much as she does, is she makes sure that when she has her egg, that the egg has all the lunch and all the nutrition that the baby needs to grow. And then it, when it's ready to hatch, it just swims out the end. Um, and the shark is on its own. It doesn't hang out with mom anymore. Uh, so nice picture. Thank you, Miss Alicia, for showing us that shark egg picture. Okay. And then we also have a question uh, from Appa and Junie. They want to know, how does a clownfish camouflage? Ooh, that's a good question because does it look like this clownfish is camouflaging very well in this anemone? No, it kind of looks like it's standing out pretty, pretty easily, just like this one too. Now there are, did, did you notice that those, I both, I referred to both of those as clownfish, but they look very different. Now this clownfish is kind of the classic, the common clownfish that most people think of, but it's a type of an anemone fish. And that other one we showed you is also an anemone fish. They have different markings, but what's special about them is where they live. So they live in the sea anemone. And what's special about that is that most fish, they can't hang out in sea anemones because if they swim into a sea anemone, the sea anemone will sting them. So sea anemones have these stinging cells in their tentacles but they don't sting the clownfish. So look at how comfortable this fish is, another anemone fish hanging out inside all those tentacles. Now, he actually have this, he has this sort of layer over his body, this mucus that protects him from the stings of the, um, of the anemone that he's living in. Now, another fish though might swim by and get stung. The anemone doesn't sting this fish because it almost doesn't even recognize that it's there because it just feels like part of itself. Because when this little baby clownfish was growing up, he was growing up right underneath this anemone. And so it gets kind of the, sort of the smell, the chemical signature we call of it, uh, we call it of the anemone all over his body. So as he swims through it, he's not getting hurt. Uh, but by having this color that kind of stands out, because notice he doesn't blend in very well either. But by having those colors that are bright and colorful, it's like a warning to let other fish know, 
hey, don't mess with me because I've got a good way of protecting myself. Or, hey, if you want to come follow me, just come right here. Come have dinner at my house, right? And so as they come on over to the sea anemone, then it's providing food for the sea anemone. So it's a special relationship that the anemones and the clownfish have um, because it provides the anemone provides protection for the clownfish and the clownfish provides food for the sea anemone. But good question. So sometimes they don't use their coloring to help them blend in and camouflage, but they use it to help them communicate that, hey, you might want to be careful with me because I've got a good way of protecting myself. Uh, so good questions. Thank you. And if you have any other questions, go ahead and feel free to text them in and we'll be sure to answer them um, live for you as our program is going. So we said that fish use gills to breathe. We said that they have fins all over their body. Um, and we said that they also have scales on their body. But I'd like to, again, take a closer look at some of these fish and look for some other special adaptations that they have. So, oh, here comes our another picture of our zebra shark. So here's what they look like in their adult um, stages. So remember that picture we saw earlier with those dots. That was the younger zebra shark, um, but this is what they look like as they're older. Now we have a stingray. You can see that big long tail of our eagle ray uh, that just swam by, and we have a diver down there. Now think about it. A scuba diver is almost like a fish wannabe because our bodies aren't designed for spending a lot of time underwater and moving around very well. So if you look at what the scuba diver has, since he can't keep coming up to breathe, um, the air from the surface, he has his air in a tank on his back to help him be more like a fish to be able to stay underwater long like a fish can. Now he's still not breathing the water like the fish, but he can use his air um, in that air tank. Now he also has, of course, the giant, uh, the queen's grouper is hiding him right now uh, behind that big giant body. And you can see though on his feet, the scuba diver has fins. He's got his own fins to help him be more like a fish to power himself, power himself through the water more easily. But if you notice right behind, oh, look at the, e, um, sorry, not the eel, the stingray right here. Oh, there's another one. Right behind his eyes, he's got these holes. And those holes are spiracles. So on the underside of his body, the stingray still has gill slits, kind of like the gill slits of a shark that they use for breathing. But a lot of times, stingrays are sitting on the bottom. They have a shape that is very different than the other ones we've looked at. It's very flat. It's called depressed. So we have a depressed-shaped fish that sits on the bottom. And if he's sitting on the bottom and he's covering over his gills, he's not going to be able to breathe very easily. So he uses those spiracles right behind. So here is a picture of the underside where his gills are. But again, if he's sitting on the bottom down here, he's not going to be able to breathe very well through there. So that's when he uses these spiracles. In fact, you see it looks like there's bubbles coming up from right now from that little opening right behind the eyes. And they use that kind of like how we would use a snorkel if we're in the water and we don't want to keep bringing our head up to breathe and we don't have a big old oxygen tank on our back. Uh, that's how we would breathe. So they can breathe through those spiracles. So really interesting adaptations for different types of fish and the different habitats that they live in. So again, if you have any questions, we have just like another couple minutes to answer any. Uh, but we would invite you to also contact us by emailing us at live at lbaop.org if you have any other questions. You can text your questions right now live to 562-286-1838. Uh, but go ahead, take a look at them as they're swimming. Look at the colors and look at how tall and skinny this particular fish is. Now, their shape also can help them give you a clue as to how fast they are. If you look at the shape of these fish and you compare it to, oh, actually, well, those are swimming pretty fast. Those are Mexican look down fish right here. They're compressed. So they're very flat from side to side. When they start swimming right at you, it's almost like they disappear. Um, almost like these, oh, did you see the one with the, the horn on its head? That's called a unicorn surgeon fish. Now, again, they have a skinny shape but usually the wider a fish is, the slower it's going to be. Um, and if they're more kind of having more of that football shape, um, they're more pointed in the front and in the back and a little bit wider in the middle, but all around, they're very hydrodynamic. They tend to be faster swimming fish, but this fish is not one of the fastest ones. It's got a pretty wide body, but it does have really bright coloration. Uh, this one's very dark. You can't see all of its coloration, but there's something very cool about it right at the base of the tail. 
And oh, here's another one. This unicorn surgeon fish. Look at the base of the tail. Do you see those two little lines that are sticking out? Those are actually spines. And what the surgeon fish does is he can swim through schools of fish and to protect himself, he'll use those little spines that stick out to make sure that um, other organisms, other um, whether it be someone who's diving or someone, a fish that's swimming by, isn't going to hurt him because he's got sharp little spines on the base of his tail. And that's why he's called a surgeon fish. Just like surgeons need sharp things for cutting into things when they're doing surgeries, that's what these fish will use. So even this fish, Dory, right? The palate tang or the palate surgeon fish, um, right here at the base of the tail, at the tip of that yellow triangle. So where that yellow triangle meets the rest of its body, that's where it has this little spine that sticks out. It, and it's yellow on this, so it camouflages really, really well. But ooh, right there, do you see it? There's that little line. That's actually a little yellow spine. So whenever you're looking at fish in an aquarium and you look at this part where the tail, the caudal fin, and the rest of the body come together, look for that. If you see that little spine sticking out, that's a surgeon fish. And we have a number of surgeon fish in our tropical reef exhibit. So if you're ever watching our webcams, go ahead and look really carefully and see if you can find any uh, that might be sticking out. Now, kind of hard to see in the shadows here because it's not the brightest um, location where our camera is. Uh, but anytime you're anywhere around fish, look for those little spines sticking out. If you see them, it's a surgeon fish. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So hopefully you've enjoyed looking at some different types of fish with me, uh, looking at their fins and knowing that they all pretty much, most of them have scales. There's a few exceptions, uh, but they use them differently and how they swim can be different um, from species to species. Uh, but they all use gills for breathing um, oxygen from the water, very different from you and I. But thanks for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Bye everyone.